All right, welcome Sarah Tiedemann um, to our Club FCMY Spotlight interview. Um, you are my former teacher uh, and you're out in Oregon. You're the artistic director of Third Angle New Music in Oregon. Um, and you used to teach at Willamette University and several other colleges around that area. Um, so welcome. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do uh, out there and we'll get started. Yeah, so like you mentioned, I'm the artistic director of Third Angle New Music. Um, we're a contemporary music organization that's been around almost 40 years. And we do a lot of commissioning and like event um, performances. I play with the Oregon Ballet Theater Orchestra here in Portland. Um, and I also teach at Vincent Clark College and at Portland Nice. Yeah. Uh, do you or do you have a lot of private students besides your college level students? Um, not as many as I used to. I actually have kind of held things a little bit. Um, yeah. I took a few more students on during quarantine times um, because we were also uncertain about performing. That I thought I'd better <laughs> intellectually financially. <laughs> um, so I have a few non-local students now. Um, nice. And as far as local students, it's kind of the same mix with the school. So I think between the colleges and privately, and at like 12 students right now. Wow, cool. And you're really busy with the artistic director stuff. So it's probably doesn't need to, you don't need to have as many like private students because you have got plenty going on. There's a lot. I think yeah. that's pretty typical. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, so when you started teaching, was that something that you like initially really wanted to do, or did you have a different idea in mind when you um, started studying music? Well, I think I always imagined myself teaching just because that's what I had seen my own private instructor do. Um, she played with the Portland Opera Orchestra. I think she might have played in the ballet too at some point, um, and she taught privately. And she was at a college, so I kind of I don't know if people <laughs> who are watching believe in manifesting and visualizing, but that seems to be what happened with me. Um, my mom was a second grade teacher growing up, so there were a lot of teachers around me and my family. Um, so I, I, I think I started teaching in college and just sort of never stopped. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I have similar experience, though. It wasn't teaching... I did music and all my family is in sales. And so I found a way to like, it like creeps in somehow. And my brother does sales too. So somehow the, the family like creeps in and the family business is still, still in there a little bit. Exactly. But do you adhere to like a specific teaching method or, I mean, you can go off from there, but like certain books or are there certain teachers that you've learned from that you kind of absorb what they do and, and find really useful? Mm -hmm. So y you caught me early on. <laughs> I did a bigger, a bigger studio. So at Willamette, I had a pretty big studio. Were there what, 12 of you, 14 at some point? Seems about right. Thinking about studio um, classes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that was a bad drive for me. <laughs> so I ended up uh, in Portland, not driving so much, but I met two colleges with much smaller studio sizes. Uh, mm -hmm. So I had to kind of adapt for that. Back in my Willamette days, I was very formulaic about how I was working with students on sales. I'm sure you're probably still having nightmares about it. Uh, <laughs> we have certain levels for each semester. Yeah, yeah. And I think I still level. have that book somewhere. I do refer to it occasionally. <laughs> yeah, we had a, a scale test as part of juries at the end of each term. Uh, and you all had to watch a certain number of other people. And I definitely stole that directly from my teacher in the undergrad mm -hmm. one with Michelle DeVos. Uh, I did a different set of things. Um, he has his scale game and there was some of that incorporated, but there was a lot more um, outside the Capinol and Gobert book. So with the youngest ones, I used um, Phyllis Luke and Patricia Jordan books for 
Yeah. And at that point, I go usually to the Garibaldi and see if they can put some good transition into intermediate things. And from there, you know, the usual suspects, but I try to mix it up. I don't just put students in an Anderson book and make them go all the way through the book because I think that gets really dry. Yeah. Um, so I'll mix in some fuller, something more romantic because I think etudes should be a joy. <laughs> and I go through the normal, you know, the normal repertoire. I always use the same piece for teaching vibrato. It's an arrangement of of Tchaikovsky's June. Mm -hmm. um, How do you manage your lesson time with your students? And what do you do if they don't practice? I kind of know, but <laughs> <laughs> well, it's different with different ages. Yeah. Um, I, I like to start out with warm ups. Um, sometimes you want them. Um, sometimes I use the melody from the Trevor Y book, mm -hmm. um, the Tom Development ones book. Um, then we go on to scales and take and solos. Sometimes yeah. I do a bit and do the solos first. I think it's good to mix it up. Mm -hmm. I'm working more and more with students on drones. The past few years, playing with drones. Um, that's just a wonderful tool for working on pitch and yeah. YouTube. There are some really good cello drones that are good to play along with. Um, as far as when they don't practice, it depends on how old they are. Uh, in college, I've, it depends. <laughs> um, with non-majors, sometimes we just have a talk and I try to meet them where they are. Like mm -hmm. if I have a, a pre-med student, they just might not be able to practice that much and I yeah. to, to be reasonable about it. And we might play duets more in their lessons than I would with other students. Um, if I have a major who's not practicing, <laughs> I can see you smirk him. Uh, I bribe you with like cookies or something. <laughs> Uh, you did. <laughs> I had gotten cookies a few times. The, the two, you know, there's the talk. Like, you need to reassess your goals and how you mm -hmm. want to get there, and you need to have real time about what it's going to take. Then there's, um, you didn't practice enough or you didn't practice sufficiently, so I'm going mm -hmm. to go to my office and listen to you practice for the next hour. Did you ever get that one? Oh, yes. The, yeah. the penny, the... <laughs> We had like pennies on a stand and like yeah. counted how many times you did it right before you could like yeah. move up one click on the metronome. Yeah. I still I use that to this day on hard spots. <laughs> penny game is the greatest, the greatest game. Um, and it, you know, I would say I've learned over the years that at least half my job, maybe more, is teaching people how to practice, mm -hmm. how to play. Um, and I do think that there is a real opportunity listening to someone practice when you're not guiding them, when you're just sitting there watching them. Um, so it ends up being beneficial, even though it feels like punishment. Yeah. <laughs> it's two wonderful purposes. Um, uh, and then with my younger students, you know, sometimes I'll talk to their parents. Um, we have realistic discussions about what it takes and consistency and all that. Um, and, you know, I, I care about consistency. I don't care about how many minutes they're playing as much as I care about them getting through their material. So I tend to focus on that. In desperate times, I've had them keep practice logs. But you yeah. Just, you don't learn this well enough. Yeah. I've threatened them with practice logs. I've never done it yet. I don't know how effective I feel it would be for, you know, the students I've been working with, but we would see. Um, when, when you do watch people practice, do you just sit by and watch, or do you stop partway through and try and help them build better methods when they're practicing for you during a lesson? Yeah, usually I'll give them a big enough chunk of time that they feel like I'm just watching. Now I'm giving away all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, that might be like 20 minutes or 30 minutes of an hour lesson, um, and I'll take notes. Usually I make it look like I'm just doing other work. <clears throat> but I jot down, and then we'll talk about what they need to do to practice better, and they practice together some. Yeah. 
right out expectations at the end of the lesson. But I do, I mean, yeah, I everything needs to be a learning opportunity. So I'm like, yeah, just let them do it wrong. <laughs> not say anything. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to use that. I, I picked up some tips on the last interview, but, but definitely going to use that more because that's something I try to focus on is learning how to practice really well because um, I came to flute lessons with you, I think, as a very green student. Like I'd never had a true private teacher. So like actual practice skills, like how to practice well are something that I feel very strongly about since that was something that I felt like had I had those tools I probably would have advanced faster early on, earlier on before I got true lessons. So yeah, something I try and focus on when I teach. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the business side of things. Um, how, I guess we kind of talked about this a bit, but since you are a teacher at a college or several colleges, you kind of have that built in advertisement where people probably can look you up easily. Um, but have you done any other advertising on social media, building a website? Mm -hmm. I have a website. Um, I do get some students who just find me with Google searches. Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of students referred to band directors. Um, I don't love working for free, but I do think when somebody's first starting out, offering to do free clinics with bands. Yeah. Well, you not do, do a one-off. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't recommend people do that consistently with the same band because you're taking work away from someone who may have otherwise gotten paid for it. That's the thing yeah. to be really conscious of when people are starting out. You want to, like, make all the connections and do things for free, but you have to make sure you're not um, affecting others' finances in the process. Uh, I haven't really advertise our local flute society, even Greater Portland Flute Society has a teacher working page on the website, so mm -hmm. we it on there. Um, but a lot of it is my kids and fans start to get better, and then their friends, <laughs> they challenge them for their friend for their care or something, yeah. and their friend wants lessons too. Okay. Um, and then... Um, this is, we, we all hate talking about money, but like, how do you, you don't have to like disclose like lesson rates or anything, but how do you determine how much you're going to charge and, um, how do you make sure that students are paying? Yeah. Well, using Venmo has helped a lot. Um, so they can just do it so quickly. I don't need to worry about them getting to bring cash or, you know, checks. <laughs> Actual paper checks. Yeah. Um, so I use Venmo a lot. Um, I know some people use like an invoicing software. I don't do mm -hmm. that. I don't have time to set that up. Uh, I have actually kept my rates a little lower than people in town because um, I've found that a lot of the students I enjoy teaching the most have come from lower income families. Mm -hmm. And I've toyed with the idea of whether I want to leave my rates low or have them higher but offer scholarships. Um, and I'm, I'm still toying with that. I think, you know, that's kind of what colleges do. They jack up the price more and more and more mm -hmm. pay in particular and then try to make it look better for um, giving out aid. So I don't have a good answer to whether or not that's better, but I do think it's that it goes to make sure lower income students can afford lessons um, yeah. for moral reasons, but also sometimes they just buckle down better. You know, there's something to be said for having a, a set of life challenges built in being used to having to really work the thing. Yeah, that's true. So with um, like a marathon day where you've got to do <laughs> several things teach a bunch of students like how do you stay fresh how do you like come to each student with uh without feeling like low energy or giving them you know as much as you can so that they feel like they got everything out of a lesson um sometimes i absolutely don't <laughs> you know i'll always be honest um i remember so when i taught at willamette i went three days a week and it was 
at least an hour each way. It was pretty consistently an hour mm-hmm. by the time I left. And sometimes it was more, especially on the way home. Uh, and I would just be exhausted. Um, so the, <laughs> I studied with Jeannie Backstresser in grad school. And I remember her giving us a, a, a look. Speech, a lecture, I don't know, about how it, it was important for us to bring our A game as students to the point where our teachers would be engaged. So I do feel like some of that responsibility actually falls to the students. Um, and, you know, I try to be kind of straightforward about that. Like, I'm really tired. You need to pep it up and be really focused with this lesson. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> jokingly have said back in the day, I'm really sleepy. If I fall asleep, it's your fault for being boring. <laughs> so, I mean, kind of jokingly, but, um, you know, I think there's this idea that I struggle with as a performer by nature um, and as somebody who really cares about my students and wants to do a good job and keep them motivated um, there's this idea that we are performing at lessons while we teach. Mm-hmm. And I think it's easy to put too much of the responsibility on ourselves and let our students off the hooks. Yeah. You no, know, I think that's very true. Um, I was talking to Jill uh, O'Neill in our other interview about just kind of being real with your students. And I think if you meet them right there, where you're at and where they're at, I think they're more apt to like, engage if you're just kind of real with them and be authentic um how has teaching changed your own playing in good ways and bad (laughs) honestly (laughs) um the thing i have struggled with the most i early on it was very beneficial to kind of stop and think about what i was doing um i've been I'm naturally a more intuitive person, my Myers-Briggs type, my, <laughs> the intuitive uh, letter is the strongest of all of them. And so I really had to figure out what I was doing to be able to communicate to those students who don't operate that way. Um, I learned a lot by playing with my teacher and I can just kind of um, feel what people are doing and physically adapt without thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Like superhero power, but also it can be really, um, really good and really bad when you're teaching. So a more concrete understanding of what I was doing physically has helped. Um, also, it, in a weird way, it's helped me as someone who plays second flute a lot um, because I feel what my students are doing along with them. I can play along with them and physically have what they're doing manifest in me mm-hmm. and stop and figure out what I'm doing. And, and then that's usually what they're doing too. So if their throats are closed, I'll realize I'm playing with my throat closed. Mm-hmm. Um, so that has been great. However, um, the next level of that more concrete understanding has been, I really have to fight with myself to keep playing intuitively when I'm practicing and to not start microanalyzing everything I'm doing mm-hmm. and and treating myself like someone who is a more like, concrete, physical understander of things and to just let myself feel it, feel it out, go back to the same exercises I've been doing since high school that are just kind of in me and let my mouth find the right position. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I can see that. Like wanting to go back and analyze your own playing like you are your own teacher, I guess. And messing with things that were just fine as they were like don't yes <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah um all right so just last question for you um for aspiring teachers or people who are just getting started like what words of wisdom do you have for them uh, as they are kind of beginning their journey into doing more teaching mm-hmm. well my first my first and probably most important thing I can impart to people is not to take on too much debt when you go to school. Mm-hmm. Um, to embark on your career with a realistic assessment of where you are, what you want to do, whether you're, or not you're willing to put in the work to do it. Um, 
I think you need to be willing and ready to communicate those kind of ideas to your students. So you need to start out with that in the first place. But you know, don't don't spend eight thousand dollars a year on a on a degree that you're not going to put to use. Now that doesn't mean don't major in music. Um, absolutely major in music, no matter what you want to do in life, you can do it with a music degree. I always kind of believe that. Um, but if you have the choice to go to a slightly more prestigious school uh, versus a, a less expensive school that still has a great teacher and will get you a degree but you'll come out not owing you money or something, um, unless you are super committed, practicing a lot, um, Committed to like having an orchestral career, um, I, I would go for the less expensive school at this point. Um, that's me. <laughs> uh, you know, others might feel differently, and I don't want to undercut the conservatories I went to because they yeah. were great schools, and I, I learned so much from my fellow students and from the faculty. But um, and the debt situation at this point is just. I have friends who owe two hundred three thousand or not three hundred a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars to just up a creek. Um, yeah. So that's thing number one. Uh, and thing number two is tricky because I don't know how well it works when you're starting out. But um, I've been really focused lately on defining what is essential in my life and what is not. Um, I've been much more picky about students I take. Uh, if it's not working out, I refer them to another teacher. Um, and I would say that, you know, you have to do what you have to do to pay your rent when you're starting out. But as soon as you can try with it, get rid of anything that doesn't fulfill you. But, you know, you work up to that. <laughs> Anything else? No. It's just really nice to see your face. <laughs> Anybody watching this know that Alex, was, we're not supposed to have favorites, but so, while I'm, <laughs> while I'm <laughs> being authentic, Alex is one of my favorite students of all time. I'm sure you can see why. It's a lovely nice. um, I hope everybody will get you playing the flute on here one of these times because... Still one of the loveliest interpreters in this book that I have heard. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're actually going to do a recital this winter for FCMY. Don't hold me to it, everybody. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to do something. Not sure what yet, but something. <laughs> Good to have something to keep you in shape. This last I know. I'm tempted to pick something really difficult that I've never done before. And then like also need to temper like how much I am actually practicing all the time, so. You know, and I guess this could be one last thing for people to absorb as teachers. Sometimes you need to not have the student or yourself <laughs> play the piece with the far reach. Mm -hmm. Instead, make sure that you're cementing fundamentals back in the right way. So, yeah. All right. Not in there. <laughs> Taking that home with me. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'll link some information actually about um, Third Angle New Music down below, and um, you can learn about more about Sarah there. Um, but thanks so much for doing this, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. My pleasure. Nice to see you. Thank you. Me too. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to learn more about our guests, there's more information below. If you're a teacher, make sure to sign up for Club FCNY to unlock free shipping, extended trials, and commission for teachers, as well as other exclusive benefits for you and your students. As always, remember to like, comment, and subscribe.